have with us today Paul Beckett, the Bureau Chief of South Asia of Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones. He's been here since January 2007. Paul, um, when you arrived here, were you given a brief at all of India? Did you have any sort of idea of what to expect and what you were going to do? Uh, not very much at all, to be honest. I hadn't much experience uh, to my shame before that. But uh, I think from a paper standpoint, we were pretty clear that India had, in our view anyway, from far away, crossed a threshold that meant that we had to cover it far, far more closely and far more as a big story, a big business story, a big economic and political story. And even my predecessor in this job was based in Singapore, and we covered India from Singapore, and we decided you just can't do that anymore. So we really wanted to beef up from the start, I think. Has the big India story turned a little sour now? Yeah. I think it has. I mean, I think when I got here, uh, there was huge optimism. In fact, the first year, first year we were here, we did this big series called India's Great Leap Upward. And, and it won an overseas press club award and people loved it. And it was just, it was like, come on, you know, the whole country's off and running. It's on the rise and we're all going to join up with it. And uh, last year we did a series called Flawed Miracle, which was also won an award, but it was a completely different series, which was like, this the is... Opposite, yeah. This hasn't worked out as a lot of people uh, thought it would. And I don't think we were wrong in either sense. I just think we reflected what the vast majority of, or a lot of Indians were thinking as well. Does the uh, Western corporate world lobby for change of uh, po Indian policy and uh, change in the red tape? They do, yeah. I mean, I think they, well, in terms of lobby is a loaded term, but certainly they press for it anyway. I mean, I think the, the US embassy here in Delhi, I mean, one of its big roles is commercial access. And the US officials are very upfront about it. Do you see a division between what is happening in private enterprise in India and where the present government is at? Is it, as I would suggest, that this government is still in a socialist mind frame with lots of bills pending which are like free dole, and the country itself is in complete liberalization, globalization mode? And that's where the clash is? I think you'd have to define the country a bit there, to be honest. I think India's business community would adopt every reform measure that the government has proposed and has pending and everything else. But isn't, it's not India's business community's issue to deal with the hundreds of millions and still hundreds of millions of people who have a difficult time making a living on their own. So it's just inevitable that any Indian government is going to have to focus on the people that need that help. What the best way of help is, you know, is a matter of debate. I don't think it's NREGA, and we've written that. I, I do think, you know, that there's been a big emphasis on subsidies in this country that could offer a political opening on the other side, let's say, but it never does for some reason. In the short period that you've been here, how have you picked up all these Indian Hinglish? Uh, in your, especially in your satirical pieces, like we passed a motion in Parliament, Chuck De, I didn't write that, did I? Amadmi, I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> in the real times. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, we just, I mean, that's, we, you just, you pick it up just by being part of the culture. I mean, this is a very, very accessible culture, a very accessible country. Do you see Indian films? Yeah, some, so you got honestly, but with, with not as much Hindi as I would like to have. With very little, as I say. But um, I love Indian movies. But you included Chuck De, another term. Yes, 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 yes. Of course, naturally, there is a big difference in your articles in India Real Times and the satire yeah. uh, in them. And I think the satire is the most fun. It's, it's just, I don't know how you I got... I hope it would be more fun than our business report. I, I don't know how you got our ethos, <laughs> but I guess it's part of Western imperialism to come here and tell us how to do it. The, it's the only journalism that you can do between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. Fiki, Fiki, you wrote a kind of a sarcastic piece on them. What do you think of them? What do you think of the organization? I don't know. Uh, Rajiv Kumar is great. I like him very much. I just, uh, I think, I didn't mean it to be sarcastic. Is that the one about the points that they had for yes, fixing yes. the economy? Yeah. Honestly, I, for that one, they put a huge amount of press gumph, you know, they put out these few, and you were handed the statement, the full statement, and then they sat down and read the full statement. It was just a bit much. Mm -hmm. But I just took out the interesting bits, as far as I was concerned. How, how did the judgment on the Vodafone case um, affect foreign investment, you think, in India? <clears throat> I th well, the judgment on the Vodafone and case... And the government's reversal. Yeah, the judgment on the Vodafone case was, a, I think, got India back to par on foreign investment. 
you know, I don't think everybody suddenly cheered because this was a very lengthy process. It took a many, many years and to resolve itself. But when it resolved, I think the foreign investor community said, OK, India's back to level. You know, we'll forget it and we'll move on. So that's why the, in March, when they came out with the retroactive tax laws, which they're still trying to explain, they're still trying to define, and still trying to reassure people about, was was brutal for these guys. I think they're. Just, I mean, you've seen some IKEA and Coke have come back recently, and that's great. Those are very, very long term. I think for the smaller company that's like India's, you know, does that fit for us or not? We ought to be there. They're, their lawyers around them are just saying, don't, don't, don't do it. I think that's devastating. What motivated you to report uh, on the baby, on baby Falak? That was something that um, earlier in the year, my colleague and I, Krishna Pokharal, had done a serialization online, which we decided to try and do it. We just thought Dickens used to serialize novels, so why can't we use the internet to give a chapter a day for six days and see if people will come along with you? you know, see, so it opens up all these possibilities in terms of long form narrative. So we tried it on the Sister Valsa John uh, Malamal case in Jharkhand, a nun that was murdered. And that, that had worked out pretty well, and we were looking for another topic. Um, probably wrongly, we didn't pick up on Baby Phallic at the time uh, for the journal. You know, we didn't tap in. We couldn't quite see how that would be a journal story. Um, but in a way, I'm glad that we didn't, because it meant that when we thought, well, these work if you have a really strong plot and a great read over the course of six days, as you would with a novel. What other personal sagas and personal stories that also tell you something about India? What, what others are there out there? So we started looking into the baby Phallic thing. Within about two weeks, Phallic died. And we thought, well, what do we do now? And I think a lot of people, as we said in the piece, a lot of people were following the story and said, oh, well, okay. that's sad. You know, we'll all move on. And we just thought, well, that could actually be an, that could be an end in itself for the story. Just because the baby dies doesn't mean that there's, or e even more means that there's a phenomenal story that goes, leads into this. So that's how we started looking into it. And it took us, what, three months probably? Well, it's remarkable reporting. I, to Thank our you. viewers, I would say if any journalist wants to know how to do a story, you have to read this Baby Falak story in India Real Times. Again, Western imperialism telling us how to do it. Um, Again. <laughs> <laughs> doing it better than us. No, no, we just, showing off, look, showing that, off. That, that, no, we just, we're doing something different for the, for the Wall Street Journal. It's remarkable. The Wall Street Journal it's doesn't really do these. Stuff. They haven't done these before. We're the only, so we're not um, trying to teach uh, It's like, it has everything. You're crying, you're laughing, you're moved. That poem, very, I mean, badly translated atrociously translated. Okay, I'll pass that It's a very difficult, <laughs> uh, you know, it, the, a lot of the sense of the Hindi is lost, you know, such as the word like jhalak. Jhalak is a very difficult word to translate. It actually means fleeting glimpse, a, a very delicate word, like a fleeting glimpse. Right, right. And in the, the translators made it into an expression of innocence, where it's actually just a fleeting glimpse of in, innocence. I can because, go and change that right now. If because you like. the pain that she's suffering from only allows a fleeting glimpse of the innocence. So a, a lot of you know the whole poem is translated tra literally into hard language, whereas it's a very soft poem. And uh, so you could be a maybe you're a closet uh, serial writer for maybe you could apply for a job. Serial in writer your old doesn't age sound very to good. To for the TV series that she does with <laughs> Sas Kabi Bahu. And that kind of thing because it's full of tears. India has these. You don't. You don't need to make these stories up. India has a million of these stories that happens every single day. In fact, if we'd it's made up, dream. no one would write the baby phallic story as fiction because it's everybody would have said, "What? That's just ridiculous. That's ridiculous. You're really you're putting it on. It's a bit too much. Turn it back. I mean, you just you you it just unravels every single time. Every single episode, you're like. That's Which is when I am appalled when people accuse the media of sensationalizing stuff. You don't need to. In India, you just report it's strong it's very enough. Very true, very true. It's so strong that you can just leave it alone yeah. and report it as is. What kind of um, reaction did you have to the news of the world crisis in England? 
from the Dow Jones and from the Wall Street Journal's standpoint, it didn't have any impact on us at all. I mean, that's, we work for the same owner, but they're totally different companies. Um, it did it gave us a did uh, rebound on us a little bit when the CEO of Dow Jones stepped down, uh, but that was in response to the role that he'd held at News um, in London. So, and it was sad to see him go. Um, did you hear of these things happening in the no, sort of in this, whispers? No, we're that, not. We were. I mean, I was even I was London bureau chief before. Uh, I was in Delhi, but that doesn't. We weren't part of the Fleet Street crowd. I mean, I don't mm. think it was a huge surprise to anybody who works in that milieu on Fleet Street or in the reporting That's crowds. Dark. Yeah, I think that I think it's as it's, you're starting to see it's across the industry by the sounds of it. But um, does, did it leave? Do you think that a journalist is kind of uh, responsible also for the culture that is created by the owner? Because in, in their interrogation of Rupert Murdoch um, and James Murdoch, they did bring up uh, this question that you allowed this kind of thing to happen. It could not have happened without you making the kind of demands for the stories that were required for the paper. So do you think in that sense that it reflects on everybody? I think, I mean, you've seen as much of this as I have, to be honest. And what they said there and what it's all about, I think they can all speak for themselves. Um, I know at the Journal, the uh, ownership of News Corp has, you know, I haven't heard of any kind of the interference or the influence. They've, they've, the Dow Jones would have been in a very sorry state without, without News Corp money. So you think that kind of that financial support was essential so you can overlook all this? Not so you can overlook it, so you can invest. I mean, we've added 15 people to the Wall Street Journal in, in Delhi since I moved here, right? We have 45 people in India, and we produce 25 substantial, good, substantial India pieces a day, right? I mean, five years ago, we had two people in India, and that's a big investment, and that's why we're, that's why we're aiming at the Indian market, that's why we're aiming at the local market in Japan, Korea, China, I mean, all over Asia, there's been a lot of money pumped into bringing the Wall Street Journal to the world, basically. Is there a political point of view that is generally accepted when you write an article, that you, no. you will go in a particular direction? No, no, no. Absolutely because not. Quite Murdoch's the opposite. And the Wall Street Journal, Wall Street Journal, yeah, Wall Street Journal, is, there's a concrete wall, a genuine concrete wall between, and between the editorial page and the news side. And to readers of British papers and to readers of Indian papers, that might be a bit peculiar because you expect a newspaper to reflect a political point of view. And news pages of the journal are sacrosanct and nothing's changed in that. Murdoch is known to uh, sort of make his point of, political point of view clear mm -hmm. to his editors. Mm -hmm. And you don't feel the fallout of that? I'm about here. And Rupert Murdoch's about here, okay? So you'd have well, to ask all I, the people. To me, absolutely not, never. But you know, Paul, I was here, and Murdoch was beyond on another planet. I did an interview of Richard Gere, and at that time, my program news track was being shown on Star News from Hong Kong. And he did not allow it, because they were going into China, mm -hmm. and they did not want to do anything that would offend the Chinese. So Richard Gere's political views on Tibet and the Dalai Lama were offensive, and that story was killed. I mean, that program was killed. We didn't run a story that week. I'm India Bureau Chief, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what is the difference between India Real Times articles and your Wall Street Journal's articles? So the Wall Street Journal articles, I think, are classic uh, Wall Street Journal reporting. There's a big emphasis on context, business. on explanatory, some on business, but really across a range of topics written for an audience around the world that, that is going to read these stories, and hopefully in India as well, but they're going to read these stories all over the world, and they need everything explained, and they need it to be, have all the heft that a Wall Street Journal story comes with. The reason that we started India Real Time was to make a, to tie and stitch together a community of interest around India, around the world, that could come to us on the web and have a very, all these people already are interested in India enough to come to India real time. So you can engage with them on a more in-depth, granular, um, familiar level than you can with an audience when you're writing for it for the whole world. And for example, your live chat on 
Bibi Fala. Yeah, so we did. Was, so we did that on there. But also, I mean, you know, if we do um, analysis pieces on the Indian news, you know, I mean, people with an interest in India are going to want to know that. Such reasons on why he lost UP. I thought, I thought of a few more since then, but I can. Your jokes, your Mamta Banerjee jokes, were horrible. That didn't work. Thank you for the feedback. <laughs> but all the others were hysterical. The, uh, the apology for your part in Porngate, uh, Air India's sick day, hysterical. I thought they were really, really wonderful. But how, I, I, you know, when I'm reading it, I'm wondering, how does this guy get it? How do you get, get the ethos so on the button? It's just reporting in a different guise. I don't know. You just, it's, uh, it's fun. It's, it's fairly universal, I think. You're one of the rare writers who has criticized Catherine Boo's book. Uh, I said it was good and not great. Yeah, not great. It's not damning. But you ended with, and I'll read that, you ended with, the broadest brush is saved for the two greatest villains of all, globalization and the free market economy. Do you think this is persistent in some in the media to demonize globalization and free market without giving attention to alternatives for growth? In India, that's, it's really common, isn't it? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think it is. I mean, globalization tends to get demonized, but then, as a word, even as a word, I hardly know what it means. I mean, does it mean that I can get brie in a delicatessen in Delhi, or does it mean that 150 workers in America lose their jobs? You know, it can mean all of those things. So, yeah. so just, and both may be true, but you can't just say oh, globalization sucks. You know what? There's lots of hundreds Usage of millions. Usage of that. In that way, basically says that in the yeah, it's all very loaded, right? Text. It's all very you know, it's yes. it's it's automatically so it's just taken to be a bad thing that there's a Western hotel in Mumbai. Well, okay, but I'm just not. You then persuade me why it's a bad thing. Just don't just tell me that it's part of globalization, therefore it's bad. Show me the evidence that this is a bad thing. And at the same time, let's look for the evidence that this is a good thing. And then we'll decide on that particular case if globalization is bad or not. So and I just get frustrated by this idea. It's not, I'm not a huge supporter of globalization. I don't make it, a, or of capitalism. I don't make it a point to push these agendas at all. I'm just like, just define your terms. If you're mm -hmm. going to be so, that was my issue with the book. That, You've got incredible insights into the garbage that India creates and incredible insights into the wonderful insights into the lives of these poor people. But, but you, you, beyond the slum, it was like everybody, oh, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. These, oof, these guys are awful. That's what I felt like. I just wasn't sophisticated in that way. I'd love to have seen those people treated with the same 360 degrees that was applied to the people that they interact with. But you also pointed out uh, serious journalistic holes. Like when I was reading the, your series on Baby Falak, it showed really hard work, painstaking reporting, fact-checking. It was journalistically correct. And you pointed out um, journalistic mistakes that uh, Catherine has made in her book, leaving out, uh, uh, not following up certain interviews, not interviewing certain people, leaving question marks. Mm -hmm and just going with a mood, sort of a mood book, a mood piece, which uh, is wonderful to read, but uh, you, you, what you pointed out would only, could, I think could only be critiqued by a journalist, because you would expect those questions to be answered. I was extremely aware of the need in the uh, Baby Fallock piece. I'm always aware of the need to be accurate. I was aware of the need to be super accurate because I knew that somebody was going to come back and say, didn't you criticize Catherine Boo for not being accurate yeah. in her book? So obviously we wanted to be absolutely pinpoint. I think it was. But on, on her, I'm sure she probably did talk to these people. I wasn't really criticizing her as a journalist. It was just, what do you include and what don't you include? Well, she did a lot of hard work. And yeah, a huge amount of hard work. And, and in far more detailed journalism than I will ever achieve. I mean, that's, it was extraordinary. But it's, if that's the hard part, then just get the easy part right. I mean, the easy part is just for someone who knows or thinks about it, saying, OK, it was the Taj and the Oberoi and the Trident and the Chabad House, right? But you an know. editor could have pointed that Either out. Either that, or yeah. she just thought that was how these folks think about it. People said to me afterwards, they were like, uh, you're ridiculous. That's, you're, just, you're, just trying to, you're just trying to look 
cool because you're criticizing Catherine Root's book. Because the, you know, everybody in Mumbai refers to it as the Taj and the Oberon. So I'm like, okay, so who's, it was really more whose narrating voice are you going to adopt? Are you going to view, view it from the point of view of the people in the slum who might just think Taj and Oberoi? Or are you going to take me as a narrator and say, actually, this is what happened? And didn't quite find the right voice on that, I didn't think. But I was also what, was intrigued just, by your pointing out the interviews she didn't do. Yeah, but she may have done them and then just... Not put them in. Not yeah. decided not to let me no, know that she had done them. But it's a lesson for journalists. Because very often we are, have a tunnel vision on a story yeah. and you get what you need for the story that you have in mind without thinking that perhaps there is another side I which do, could I think, kill the impact of, of the story that you have in mind. Yeah. And we do that often yes. by excluding other interviews. The other side of the story, I mean, I, th I do think it's a, it's a, uh, quite often a failing is that the other side of the story is either non-existent or it's so buried that, you know, it's pointless, right? Mm. I mean, it's just a tenet of Wall Street Journal journalism that the other side gets their shot really high up in the story because a reader needs to know that. The other thing is if you save the denial to the end, assuming that someone denies it, then as a whole reader, you're like, okay, 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 okay. Oh, I'm almost at the end. Wow, that was really, and then what? Oh, it's all, it's all untrue. You just whiplash. You're suddenly like, whoa, wait, what? Somebody said, you've got to take that stuff, put it up high, and show the reader everything you have, and then make your case. And then that, that, that is just much more convincing. I hate stories where, you, where you're just like, oh, I see, you, you had a good argument there, or you were onto something really good there, but you just lost credibility because you didn't follow the basics. Mm -hmm. In the Bhattacharya story, the family yeah. in Norway, uh, you wrote about the Indian media. Um, because ever since this case first erupted, it has been driven by the media, hand in glove with the Bhattacharyas more than anything else, in most negative, distracting ways. We had Arnab Goswami demanding answers. Uh, we were completely blinded with a sort of human humanitarian view of the situation without fully being aware of the facts and got carried away in saving these children from, a, you know, a, the wicked a Dickensian, yeah, the wicked Dickensian Scandinavians who would take their children away from their families, from their parents. And um, so what do you think of India's current journalism, the way we do it, the way a story is taken, instead of getting, getting nightly news at 9 o'clock, we have people shouting at each other with debates. I think there's, there is a big variety in Indian journalism still. You know, there's a huge, there's, all, there's a whole television, there's whole uh, newspapers, um, and even within both of those, there are vastly differing standards of quality. So blanket statements are very difficult. Um, I would love there to be a daily newspaper. I read them all. I like bits of all of them. And there are some I just have to read because you have to read even if you don't like a particular. But I'd love there to be one. I woke up and I thought, God, this newspaper views the world like I view the world. And I like viewing the world and I trust viewing the world through the prism of this newspaper. For a lot of people, you read a, you read a newspaper sooner than you talk to your spouse in the morning. Right? So that's important. What that newspaper says to you, you should understand the world through that prism. And you should like the people. That's a little bit why we do the satire and that sort of stuff. It's just, okay, you know, it's, you but want it's that paper to be everything. But you want that, you just want that journalism to be, you want to put your feet up and read it. And I just think there's such a shortage of really great stories that are really convincing and really explanatory. The best newspaper stories in the world are stories that either break something that's incredible and you're like, wow, you got to give it to them and break it. Or they do stories that you remember for days and weeks and months. I can point you to 10 front page stories in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or you know, other great newspapers. I'm like, I remember that story. Remember that story? And how, when was that? It was like 1983. It was amazing. I can't. When was the, the time when was the last time 
you were able to say, I remember that great story for what it told me about something you read in the Indian newspaper. And I think that's sad. I think readers want that. And I think the newspapers have probably got caught up in a TV-style news cycle without doing what papers do best, which is back off, or can do best, which is back off and say, we're going to take the time. You invest your time in reading it, and we'll reward it with the time that we took to report it and write it. Well, very few reporters are allowed two months or three months to work on one story yeah, in India. And that's a shame. It's just not done. But, you know, but that is... Maximum a week, 10 days. But there's days. No, no one to blame except the newspapers themselves because they're all, you know, circulation's going up, right? This is a flourishing newspaper market. What you just said is the sort of thing that should apply when everybody's firing people and hunkering down, or might apply when everybody... Right? This is a market where people are reading, more people are reading newspapers every day. The Indian Express, according to their billboards, is adding, readership was up, what, 30 something percent. Mm -hmm. Right? And they should be like, okay, then let's reward this with journalism that India deserves. And that's just all too rare, I'm afraid. Uh, you've written about paid news. Yeah. What do you think of Times of India's business model? I mean, I told you, you ask that on every interview that you do. You know, well, recently, what they, you, I would imagine that if the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times sold their front page to an ad, there would be an uproar. Look, it's not, it's just not. There would be an uproar. It's just not the way we do business. Exactly. They've not only sold the front page, Times of India has also sold their masthead, their logo, where the eye turns into a part of the logo of the advertiser. Now, that I should recommend to New York. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You'll keep your job. <laughs> I know. No, I don't. It's still not what we do. You got to, readers got to know what they're getting. And I think that's, I don't see paid news as so dramatically. In fact, in some ways, it's more upfront. I don't like it, but in some ways, it's more upfront than, you know, people bending to an advertiser's agenda and running a story as print as a story. Well, that is the paid news. Well, I know, I know, but I know but I'm thinking more like, you know, the logo and stuff like that, right? You can figure That's that out. That's open, You yeah. can be like, okay, well, they're paying, they've sold that, you know? But this idea, you know, whether you pay for it or whether you just muscle them into it, I don't know, you know, they're both odious, mm -hmm. right? You know, if someone's just like, well, we might lose advertising if we run this, that's as bad as paid news. But it's clear they can make money without right? doing it. It's just, some editors have pointed out that it's just plain greed. It's I, think not you, I think you just, I would just, I just think there's an appetite in India for a journalism that people think is unimpeachable. And I just, I feel like they have, and I think it's, I think that appetite is there. And I so think- We've damaged our credibility. Uh, I don't know. I, don't, I think there's just something that a lot of people, when you mention publications, are like, oh, well, you know that's that way, mm -hmm. right? Or you know that's that way. Well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Or, you know, and I think that's, that's the industry could, has a huge, huge chance to be much, much classier than that. Do you see any solution? to this to, to yeah, now that we've gotten be, into this just, corrupted just yeah people just being like look you know that's not as good as it can be that's not as good as journalism can be and india deserves better india we can't you know can't beat up on all these people for ethical failures and violations or well, we can but we should then let's set an example ourselves in one of your articles you uh, mentioned the dinner seating at the UPA celebratory dinner <laughs> that Mulan Singh Yadav mm -hmm. was sitting mm -hmm. next to Sonia Gandhi, so and you brought some conclusions to it. That is a very Indian way of looking at things and reporting. What, so the other thing I should you. say, look, we've corrupted. Not at all. We've got 95% <laughs> 90, 90, of the folks that work in the office are Indian and heavily involved in the news, so they're really smart. I can, these aren't all my savvy ideas and so you just go out and like, what do you make what do you make what do you think what do you think and people just talk about no, it and that story of connecting the date of the announcement of the raise of the petrol prices the mm -hmm. oil prices that was all the right report. after the parliament yeah, session yeah, yeah, smart, closed 
We have, that smart, again, we have smart people working for us. Putting <laughs> you imperialists always telling us how to do it. What do you? That's the third time you said okay. that. Okay. Well, Paul, thank you very, very much. <laughs> You're very welcome. It was lovely speaking very to nice you. Very nice to speak to you, too. And uh, I think please continue with your imperialistic ways. We're learning a lot. Well, I'll try my best. Thank you. Thanks very much.